Hey folks, how you guys doing? Hope you're all having a great Tuesday morning as usual. It's just an absolutely great start to the week. I'm excited and I'm just pumped up about working here in the shop this week. So last week's video was on uh, restoring this hand plane. It wasn't in horrible shape before I got to it, but um, it turned out really well. Uh, these both, both of these handles are hickory. And what else? There's another question that was common. Oh, how long did I let all the metal parts soak in vinegar? About six hours. And uh, two pieces of feedback from the video. Number one, a lot of people said flatten the, when you go to flatten the bottom of the sole of the plane, to assemble it first because that can sometimes twist things. Um, this really didn't need any flattening to begin with. I just wanted to run it over some sandpaper to clean it up more than anything, not necessarily flatten it. And luckily, I guess I didn't take it out of square at all or out of being flat. Uh, I tested it by setting it on the, the table saw wing and trying to rock it left to right to see if there was any twist. There really wasn't. So uh, I just, like I said, just tried to polish it a little bit with some sandpaper. I only went to 120 grit sandpaper on the bottom of the plane. That's all I did. And I didn't polish it or buff it at all after that. I put some 3-in-1 oil on it to kind of soak into the... To the pores or the small pitting areas or scratches from the sandpaper. Uh, that does a lot for preventing rust in the long term. And then somebody else, well a couple people, a couple people asked why I didn't do anything with the front edge of the chip breaker. So blade on one side, chip breaker on the other, or um, proper terms, whatever you want to call it. There's a million different ways to call these uh, parts or there's a many, million different names for all the parts on hand planes So I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but why did I not address the front edge of it? Um, number one it, do, it doesn't need it. It looks like somebody Somewhat recently, I don't know how recent judging by the shape of the plane was before I got it, but it looks like somebody else already um, Got the, this front edge down to a nice point on the chip breaker, so I didn't need it and the video was running long as it was, so I didn't, uh, it would just slipped my mind to say something about it. So if this front edge of the chip breaker is a blunt edge, just a, just a wall right here, then the chips can kind of get, get clogged up right there. So you want to have it sloping down almost to a point, well actually to a point, similar to the blade, but not touching the tip of the blade. So hopefully that made a little sense. Um, what else? That was last week's video. Like I said, the plane turned out great. I'm really happy with it. It's not mine. I got to give it back to Sean, um, which is totally cool. Uh, just a lot of people said that I'll be reaching for it from now on, but it's not mine. It's going to somebody else. The week before last, I did a video not on my main channel, but on my second channel for just rearranging the shop. I had a slow week and it just felt really good to, uh, to get the shop rearranged. And since I've had this layout for, I guess, two weeks now, I love it. There's a lot of areas to move around. All of the machines are unobstructed. And uh, that video, I did get a couple questions, mainly on the table saw. Do I have enough in-feed and out-feed uh, to, to rip a full eight-foot sheet on the table saw? No, I do not in this particular layout. In this particular situation, I have from the kerf on the insert plate to the miter saw station, there is like seven foot two inches. So I can't rip a full eight foot sheet. But something I noticed with the last layout was I was putting a lot of emphasis on like 1% of situations. So something um, <clears throat> with, with last layout, I made sure that all of my tools had a full eight feet of in feed, eight feet of out feed at pretty much all times, except the jointer. The jointer had like seven in, seven out. And if I needed to cut a full eight feet on the jointer, then I could just wiggle it into, into position to where there was unobstructed path in both ways. It's got a mobile base, super easy to move, so that wasn't a concern. Well, in this layout, changing some stuff around, I put a little bit less emphasis on that and more emphasis on what I do most of the time, which is walk around the assembly table, use the assembly table, and you know what? It works out a heck of a lot better this way. I don't have a full eight feet of in feet, out feet on the, on the planer, but it's on a mobile base that's super easy to move, so I can just pull it out two feet towards me, and then I do. Same with the joiner. The joiner is on a mobile base, super easy to move around. So less emphasis on the 1% of situations and more emphasis on how I interact on a daily basis here in the shop. Uh, also, the table saw, 
I don't know if you guys are familiar with these saw stop table saws, but the mobile base that I have on that, it's the industrial mobile base. And if you ever go to like a uh, woodcraft or a rockler or some type of woodworking store or expo of some sort, and you mess around with one of their table saws, be sure to check out their mobile base. That is like an insanely easy uh, way to move a table saw. That, that's the heaviest thing in my shop and it moves around the easiest. And uh, not a sponsored spot or anything for their uh, saws or mobile bases but anyway what I'm saying is that's crazy easy to move and then the outfeed table that's just a plywood square really so it can be pushed forward one foot the saw can be pushed forward one foot and the jointers on a mobile base it's easy to move so it can slide out of the way so those three things could take less than a minute to accomplish and then I have my eight feet of infeed and outfeed for the table saw to make my one or two cuts that I make every six months and then put everything back and actually, I don't know if it's correct to say one cut every six months because I had my last layout for about, I don't know, six months to a year. And I don't recall the last time I ripped a full eight feet on it. I don't think I ever did. Uh, I could be wrong, but I don't think I ever did. Um, I've begun to realize that making the first cut on a full sheet of plywood with a circular saw and then taking the smaller pieces to the table saw is much more convenient than ripping a full sheet. Now I do have the capacity to rip a full sheet on my table saw, but it's a pain in the butt to do so. So I'd rather use circular saw first. Whew, what else? Um, I've been playing around with this idea for making a five gallon bucket tripod for my camera. Uh, my camera tripod is in like a two and a half, three foot square on the floor. It's kind of a well, not really with this layout, but previously it was a pain in the butt to move around. And it's easy if you bump it like that, it wiggles the camera very easily. And I've knocked it over a couple times. I'm wanting to make a somewhat tripod, bucket pod, bucket monopod, I guess you could call it, specific to my shop. So I mentioned this previously, it's been an idea for several, for a long time. Picture a five gallon bucket with three casters on the bottom. You gotta have three, that way it doesn't rock and then fill the bucket with like an 80 pound bag of quick cement. Um, stick a seven foot pole, because it has to be able to go through my garage door, a six and a half foot pole into the middle of the concrete and then wet the concrete so it's, it sets up. That's a lot of mass very close to the ground so your center of gravity is very low. And then for the pole, I probably use a piece of three quarter inch pipe because this, I, I don't really care for three quarter inch pipe clamps because they're awkward and heavy compared to half inch pipe clamps and half inch pipe clamps have all the power that I need that I've, I've uh, I figured that out anyway for what I do. So uh, I've got a couple of these three quarter inch pipe clamps and I figured this bottom jaw here uh, as you clamp stuff in this is the direction in which it's not going to go anywhere. So this would be on the pole in this direction. Uh, as the, the weight of the camera is on here, it's not going to push it down any, and then to easily adjust it, it's a clamp. So you can easily adjust the height of the camera, super quick, super easy, and then maybe on this have like an arm that comes out, or an articulating arm, something that comes out to where I could position the camera like over a table saw or over the assembly table just a little bit. Just give me more options, but this would be the up and down mechanism of the camera. And then on, on the top I could possibly put a uh, something similar to this with another articulating arm that comes out even further for like a shotgun microphone similar to the way uh, John Heiss has his. Now John Heiss, his whole camera rig system is running off of two tracks on the ceiling. I thought about that on here. The shop is just, I mean it's 20 feet long. I'd have to make this big boom arm system if I wanted to run it on tracks. Don't want to do that. And then there's um, specific little spots that you could put it on, on the ceiling for small mini tracks. Didn't want to do that. Just Kind of a hassle so i think this will be the easiest route to get a lot more portability with this camera and my tripod's falling apart i've got a bunch of tape here and there holding things together so i'm at the point where i neither i either need to a buy a new tripod or b um put my plan into action so i'm thinking about that and then for the pole coming out of the the tri uh, pole coming out of the concrete um the six feet allows me a lot more headroom uh, compared to this tripod. This tripod is is at its highest point right now. So I could probably do some like overhead down shots. That'd be pretty cool. That's all I got for you guys this week. Um, 
Oh, no, it's not. I, um, this week I'm making an easel. I want to, or I was asked to make a easel with a chalkboard frame for my sister's wedding. She's going to write something on it and put it next to the chairs going down the aisle or something like that. Sure, I'll do that. And I got back from Wisconsin with a bunch of figured chair or figured maple, uh, curly maple. And I did a test piece. I don't know if you can see it right there. There's pictures on my Instagram, but I, I tested some uh, light brown water-based dye on the curly maple and it looks great. And I was like, oh, awesome. I'm going to make a nice curly maple easel and frame and it's going to look great. And then she said that she just wants the easel painted black, the frame of the chalkboard painted white, and of course the chalkboard is going to be black as well. So at that point, I was like, well, I'm not going to paint all this curly maple, so I'm probably just going to use pine or poplar. Or if it's going to be painted, I may use a bunch of this oak that I have on my lumber rack, but I don't know if it's going to be an issue with the grain showing through because oak is a very, um, you can see the grain a lot when you paint it. So I don't know, but that's going to be this week's project. I've already sketched it up in SketchUp. And as a matter of fact, this afternoon, I'm going to make a decision on what wood I'm going to use and get to uh, planning it out. So that's it for real. You guys take care. Have a great day and I will talk to you soon.